Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for Virtual Pachaca Chop. I'm Nick Potter, Director of Community Relations and Development for the Pueblo City County Library District. We are live tonight from the Rawlings Library, hosting the 31st edition of Pachaca Chop Pueblo. Pachaca Cha is Japanese for chit chat and is the world's fastest growing presentation platform used by millions from around the globe. In 2003, Klein Diagram Architecture, based in Tokyo, invented Pachaka Cha. The initial purpose was to streamline long design presentations because they thought people liked to talk too much. I know quite a few people who have that issue. The format is 20 slides, 20 seconds each, concise, simple, engaging. Pachaka Cha is a tool used to share stories, passions, and knowledge. Global innovators use this platform to create powerful, visually compelling stories that move audiences in less than seven minutes. Since 2003, more than three million people have attended Pachaka Cha events around the world. Tonight, we have six local presenters that I would like to introduce in the order that they will be presenting. First, Aaron Ramirez. Then co-presenting, Nick Folletta and Ben Casey. Joette Yukar Diamo, Nick Pal Palmiotti, Javier Quinones, and co-presenters, Jesse Onis and Tammy Cruch. After all presentations are complete, we will have a few minutes for the presenters to answer any questions that, may, that you may have. Please submit your questions or comments through the comment section within YouTube or Facebook. We will visit these at the end of the evening and the presenters will address your questions. Please be sure to address any question you may have to the specific presenter so that we have the, per the correct person answer your question. Now, let's start, let's start off with our first presenter, Aaron Ramirez. Hello, and uh, I want to thank everyone for allowing me the opportunity to, to speak with you uh, tonight. Um, I'd like to, uh, to thank uh, the whole team who is responsible for the, the, the exhibit, Natural Framing, Life and Work of Frank P. Naramoto, um, in collaboration with the Pueblo County Historical Society, uh, National Film Preservation Foundation, uh, lab work done by Color Lab in Maryland, uh, translation work by Kay Falberg, and uh, David Muramoto, the grandson of Frank Muramoto. And, um, who is Frank Muramoto? Uh, he appears here in this photo, I believe, on the left. Uh, he's carrying his photo equipment, his camera and tripod, uh, and he's with another man. Um, we don't have a date for this photo. Um, I never knew of him. Uh, here he is in stages of his life, born in 1884 at the end of the Meiji Restoration. Uh, from uh, Yamaguchi Prefecture in southwest Japan on Honshu, the largest uh, island in Japan, uh, at the uh, at the end uh, at the beginning of industrialization, uh, with Western influences coming into Japan, he left and went to the United States in 1903, arriving in the port of San Francisco. Uh, he worked at the Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, around Greeley in the beet fields and in Texas before arriving in Illinois at the Illinois College of Photography uh, at around 1911. Uh, he learned photo techniques and how to operate a, uh, a photo uh, studio. Here's a couple of examples of some of his more artistic work there on the left and uh, his studio portraiture on the right. The right man on the right, I, I don't know his name, but he appears in many of the photos that are uh, found by Muramoto, uh, a close family friend. Um, uh, so uh, this is a map of uh, the Japanese residents and businesses done by Bree Pappen uh, from the uh, Special Collections and Museum Services Department here at PCCLD. Um, there were uh, many Japanese uh, living in, in Pueblo. In 1907, there was 400 Japanese uh, living in the city. Here's a here's a, the earliest documented photo that I found May 3rd, 1915, Lake Minnequa, um, the 
the Japanese on the left uh, says Pueblo City Japanese People Sports Day 1915. Uh, the third year of the Taisho era, which was the emperor of Japan at the time, that's how uh, years are denoted in, in Japanese. Um, here's a photo of Frank and his wife Asa. Um, in 1915, Frank went to Japan and came back newlywed to Asako Mur Murayama, um, co-meaning child. So after she was married and left her, her parents' house, her name became Asa, A-S-A. Um, this is a picture of Muramoto at his studio at 1142 East Evans and at his home at 1117 East Evans. Uh, the, per the photo on the left I thought was some sort of scientific procedure photo technique he was doing, but he's actually rolling a cigarette there. Um, here's a couple of uh, views of his studio. On the left, you see uh, skylights on the top left. This was a, a technique used in early uh, studio photography because uh, they need more lights and the, uh, to make the photograph, uh, but the, uh, and, and sun was the best way to do it. And so there's, there's drapery there to control the light. Um, this is uh, uh, clips from reel number four from the Muramoto films. He created uh, seven 16 millimeter black and white and color films. Uh, around Pueblo in southern Colorado. This is the corner of Evans and Mesa. Uh, he's filming his studio there from the exterior. Um, his interests weren't just uh, of his own endeavors and businesses. Uh, this is uh, the Western Tire Manufacturing Company, a predecessor of General Tire. You can see that they're uh, manufacturing uh, wheels and tires. There's uh, workmen and uh, managers and, and bosses here. You can note their different dress. Um, this is a picture of downtown Pueblo. Notice at the very bottom is a newly constructed levee. So this is after the flood of 1921. Um, and the, uh, the roundhouse there on the bottom right. Um, on the far left, you can see the Holmes Hardware Company uh, sign printed on the, on the side of the building that you can see today. Um, so. Muramoto um, had three children, Mary, George, and James, along with his wife, Asa, and uh, he was, uh, had a wide range of friends, and so they went around and toured Colorado and southern Colorado. So you see the Manitou Cliff Dwellings in the top left. Uh, the bottom left, you see the Cliff Palace of Mesa Verde. Um, all of this is available through the, the, the film reels uh, that are online. Um, there's Monkey Mountain, newly constructed in 1939 at the Pueblo Zoo, part of the city park. Um, you can see the animal enclosures on the right. Um, this is just one frame from reel seven of the home movies that he's uh, created and uh, have found their way to the vault here at the Smith County, uh, Smith County, oh, no, sorry, uh, to the, the Special Collections and Museum Services Department at PCCLD. Uh, these are some uh, some footage of him enjoying the outdoors with his friends. It's a nice sized trout there. Uh, they're fishing by the side of the road, as many of us do. Um, then next we have uh, an image, really interesting. He's filming with his 16 millimeter, probably uh, Kodak box camera, uh, his his uh, his still photography camera on on tripod, and they're uh, harvesting uh, beans there. And I think this might be around Rocky Ford. Uh, an exceptional uh, reel in this collection that you can find on PuebloLibrary.org slash Muramoto Exhibit um, is uh, the Great Kitahata, a series of exercises, calisthenics, and feats of strength uh, um, by this man, very strong man, who's lifting 85-pound iron balls and dumbbells. Um, and then next you see uh, the only color uh, film uh, example that I've, that I've included here on the left, you'll see Muramoto there clapping, looking at the camera, uh, probably at one of his, his children operating the 16 millimeter camera, um, and that is Miss Pao, a member of the Japanese mission. Uh, the last photo here is the first annual Young People's Conference joint meeting in Pueblo in 1935, uh, part of the Japanese Methodist community uh, that Muramoto was a part of and engaged with. Um, and so he's a remarkable man who uh, left his impression and preserved their culture, his culture, our culture, uh, and um, 
that's what I'd like to share with you here today. So I hope you enjoyed it. And again, if, uh, if you're interested, please check out the exhibit online through the pueblolibrary.org uh, slash Murimoto exhibit website. And uh, thank you very much. Hey, how's it going? I'm Ben Kaysen. I'm the podcast director at Wake Up Pueblo here with Nick. I'm Nick Valletta, and we are on, here on behalf of Wake Up Pueblo, and we do we do the uh, Next Man Up podcast, and we, what it is is a sports podcast at the Wake Up Studios in the oldest building in Pueblo. Here's a picture of us on uh, top of the building, trying not to fall off and kill ourselves. So, But there's a saying, uh, we do anything for the shot. And uh, <laughs> so that's what we did for our photographer, and we did that this past week, and uh, there we are. Yeah, so Wake Up Pueblo, if you're wondering what we are, we just got started. What we are is we are a creative omnipresence agency. So what that is, is if a business comes to us, what we're going to do is we're going to try and figure out how to really optimize your marketing. We're going to optimize your videography. We're going to optimize, you know, your social media. And for me, I'm the podcast director, so I'm doing podcasts. So I've got a lot of experience doing a lot of different podcasts. But this podcast we're going to talk about is Next Man Up, which is internal with me and Nick. Yeah, so the way, a little bit about Wake Up Pueblo is uh, Grant Cardone is a real estate billionaire. And he got together with Matt Smith here in uh, Pueblo, Colorado, and they were trying to figure out the best way to make, to turn a business into a million dollar business. And we decided to do a digital marketing and content strategy tra strategy company. And it's, it's uh, here right in, uh, on United Street in Pueblo, Colorado. And a little bit about me, uh, Nick, the stick filetta is the moniker I go by for our podcast. And uh, there's me right there, you guys can see. And uh, that's me at Highland Park Elementary School. It's uh, in... Uh, Southside of Public Colorado, and I had a nickname back then. Obviously, it was uh, the Lady Killer. So, uh, yeah, there I am there, like that, <laughs> as you can see. Yeah. <laughs> but I actually am a Pueblo native. Uh, I went to Pueblo South High School here in town, and then to CSU Pueblo. Uh, I got my undergrad in marketing, and I've done various things in the community as far as uh, event planning, marketing, uh, things like that. I never thought I'd be doing podcast work, but here I am, and I'm enjoying it. So, yeah. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. Yeah, and then I'm Ben Kaysen. I'm the podcast director. So for me, I started in Rye. So I'm originally from Texas, but I moved to Rye. So you can see there are some pictures of me doing stuff at Revity 9. That's the college radio station at CSC Pueblo. So I was really involved there for about three years. I've always wanted to do sports broadcasting. That's been a passion of mine. So, you know, I've called Bell games. I've called, you know, state championship games. That picture right there is from the South High Cold State Championship game in Mile High a couple years ago. But now I've kind of transitioned to wake up and take more of a podcast focus. And so I've done podcasts back in college, I've done a lot of podcasts, producing them, editing them, you know, actually recording them. So it's just awesome to be a part of this podcast as well, which kind of combines two of my passions, which is podcasting and then, you know, sports. So this one for Next Man Up is a combination of those two for me. And I'm really, really passionate about it. And I'm really excited about where it's going to go. Um, I got into Wake Up recently because I was looking for a job over COVID. I just graduated and I wanted to get into sports broadcasting. There wasn't any sports broadcasting jobs at that point. So looking around and then wake up came up out of nowhere literally a snapchat text from somebody who worked with before got me into wake up to be a podcaster and so yeah and i went back to school for digital marketing and i heard about the new opportunity here in town and so i went in and they're like hey can you help us build up our businesses i was like absolutely yeah so sure. how did so how did we start doing the podcast ben actually interviewed me uh for the wake up public podcast first just trying to get to know a little bit about me and who i am and then he's like, you know what? You know a lot about sports. Like, what do you think about doing maybe a podcast? And I'm like, sure, we could do a podcast. So we've been doing a podcast uh, every Thursday night here for about three or four months now. Yeah, it's been a while for sure. And, you know, podcasts, I know if you're sitting in there, you don't know what a podcast is, let me tell you what it is. A podcast is very, very personal. It's a very personal, like you go into your Spotify or Apple podcast and you click on a podcast, it's you and that podcaster. So as a medium itself, the listeners are very loyal. That's the thing about this, right? If somebody listens to you in a podcast, you're way more likely to come back to it than other mediums. So it's been called the new blogging, like it says right there. So podcasting itself is way on the rise. I mean, if we're talking about people who listen to podcasts, about 38% of Americans are listening to a podcast monthly, according to some stats. So, you know, comparatively to two years ago, that was like in the low 20s. So this thing is booming. People are checking out podcasts as well as advertising on podcasts is incredibly successful compared to traditional radio advertising traditional newspaper there's a lot of benefits sure. and so what's our format well the format that me and ben have right now is right now it's a lot of banter a lot of competitive banter back yeah. and forth 
and we do a lot of uh, a lot of money lines. So there's a lot of things going on. Like when there's a certain game and you pick a money line, we're like, okay, Ben, you take this side of the money line. I'll take that side of the money line. And at the end of the show or at the beginning of the next podcast, we kind of add everything up. And then we do interview guests. And so the big first uh, big guest we had is Justin Simmons, who is the uh, Pro Bowl safety of the Denver Broncos. He was our first guest, and we were very thankful he called in. We talked to him for about 45 minutes and learned about all of his, uh, his life, his work in the community, uh, what he's going to be doing as far as being a Denver Bronco, hopefully for the rest of his career. And uh, it was a real, as I, you can see there, I was a very, very happy to talk to him. So. Yeah, and then another one of our podcasts, we had Malik Reed. He's a linebacker for the Broncos who's kind of gotten more playing time in the last couple of years. Absolutely. But just like with Justin Simmons, you know, called in for our show, talked to him for about 30 or 40 minutes. And what we want to do for these guys who call in and give us this time is really tell their story. So Malik's story is really interesting because he's been looked over his whole life. He's from Alabama and, you know, went to Nevada out of all places because he wasn't recruited. And then he went to Denver and he's worked his way into And then we got, we kind of crossed over to the dark side. He got uh, <laughs> Daniel Carlson. He was the kicker for the Las Vegas Raiders. We talked to him last week, and a uh, very nice guy. He's a Colorado native. He kicked at the, uh, co- the uh, Classical Academy in Colorado Springs in Auburn High School. So we learned about him. And then we talked uh, to Drew Lodge back up in Denver, uh, Jeff Driscoll, who was actually the heir apparent to Tim Tebow at Florida. Very interesting guy. Yeah, and we're not only doing national guys like we're talking about. We're also working on doing more local. We've done interviews with the Pueblo Bulls and Pueblo Rangers here in town, which people are listening to this. You know, those guys are staples in the sports community here in Pueblo. So our goal is... We want to, you know, get some of these national guests and talk to them. But in the same vein, we really want to talk to the local guys as well in the future and build that into our podcast. So what are our future plans for the broadcast? We want to get more guests. Uh, and like Ben was saying, both national and uh, local guys. We know a lot of local guys in the community that do a lot of great work. We are going to start an Instagram page. So that's a very good way to plug our podcast to get more viewers. And we want to get more uh, videos. So we want to start broadcasting live on YouTube. And uh, hopefully those best stuff that's going to happen in the next uh, month or two. Yeah, we're working on a studio for that. So that's not the only podcast though, that Wake Up is doing. Next Man Up is a big part of what we do, but I also do a podcast called Pueblo Passion. Javier Quinones, who's actually coming up in a few presentations here, was on that podcast. So you can go get hear more about Javier, as well as a few other people here in Pueblo that are really making a difference. We talked to President Mote from CSU Pueblo. It's really a lot of people. We're getting Mick Dratis in a few weeks, so you know that's another one to check out. Yeah. And how can you listen to the next Man Up Sports podcast? Pretty simple. Spotify or uh, Apple, I, uh, Apple, Apple Podcasts, Apple yeah. podcasts on yeah. Apple Music. And uh, once again, here's a photo of Ben and I on the side of the building. Uh, with our we risked it for you guys. We risked it all for you guys. So I <laughs> hope you guys are extraordinarily happy. And uh, like Ben said, yeah, podcasts are very, very popular now. So yeah. take, a, take a listen. Yeah, and we are so honored that you guys would have us for your coffee shop. We really, really appreciate it, you know. Check out Wake Up Bubble, all the great things we're doing. Find us on Instagram, on YouTube, on Twitter, on everywhere you can find Every stuff. Every platform you can media. Think Absolutely. of Wake Up Bubble. Check us out. If you want to come get a tour, contact us. Come see the building. As you can see right there, it's a really cool building, really cool space. Yeah. The yeah. oldest building in Pueblo. Oldest building in Pueblo. We really, really appreciate you guys. Thanks, guys. Yeah. You guys are awesome. Everybody in this room, everybody who's watching, we appreciate you guys. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, the store is located in the heart of Pueblo downtown. We're in Central Plaza. We've been in Pueblo for two years, and it is basically myself and my husband, and we're rebuilding a crew in this post-pandemic America we live in. So, I just want to share with you a little bit about the narrative of what it's been to be a dreamer or a restaurateur. Uh, my husband and I met in Rome in 2008, and we're pretty well inseparable after getting lost amongst the Roman streets from the Termini, which you see on the left, and talking about this restaurant that we now own and operate. Um, we're basically conceptualizing this idea of tapas, which really is the new snack. It came from this region of Spain and uh, everybody has their own story on what it is, what the take is. It's usually a lot of peppers, a lot of fish, and um, for the bass, pinchos. What you see here is basically our Chef Select Tapas tray that we've founded all of the soil on. And pinchos, not pinchos, 
in public. But Pinto is definitely a Christini. A uh, quick story about that, the Bass wanted to make a lid for their wine to keep the flies out, and ultimately you had that as an edible lid. So bringing that to the Pueblo market has been an interesting endeavor. We um, named a lot of our dishes in unique ways that ask people to get outside of their box of food. This is a green chili town. Everybody loves their slopper and has a favorite spot and staple. And um, for us, we're moving into what used to be the Plaza Cafe or Steak and Eggs. And uh, it was ultimately a greasy spoon for a good two decades. So over the course of two years, we have transformed that, put in ambiente that can help you escape our uh, confines. And uh, Bistoro has become kind of a, a thing of its own beyond what we originally dreamed. Pueblo definitely started making requests of us. So we thought we were just gonna do our garlic bisque and our bocatas and a couple of tapas. Bocatas are those really wonderful sandwiches with marinated meats. Pueblo loved the ambiente. They embraced that immediately. They started coming back for that. We ended up putting a patio on the outside and uh, that has grown to an outdoor area that the city has given us in this post-pandemic time to you know, accommodate people outside. Um, the Pueblo chili is something that my dad fell in love with as somebody from Spain. So it has always been incorporated into my own recipes but that was kind of like the core of what we wanted to do was give this conceptualized Mediterranean menu that was based on both snacks and entrees that you can share. So we uh, hit it hard with Pueblo and said, all right, we're going to be part of our wonderful chambers, the Latino chamber and the greater chamber. And we started entering all of the little, uh, you know, uh, uh, contests and we, started winning awards for our use of Pueblo Chile. So um, because of that ambiente, we ended up going towards uh, uh, you know, the wine and all of those really interesting drinks that people serve you along the Mediterranean. Everybody's got a something different, whether it's grappa or rafi or, or you know, their house wine. So um, we decided to go forward with that. And it was really embraced by social media. That's when we really kind of found ourselves on um, on the radar of most people in Pueblo. Everybody kind of likes their great glass of wine or their margarita or their martini. So we continued with this idea of an escape to Europe. And Pueblo quickly transformed our sandwiches into other things. So now our sandwiches became something that you can top a salad with or sweet potato fries with or wine tossed veggies with. And um, still focusing on those, you know, core recipes that the little ladies along the Mediterranean, whether it's Italy or Greece, uh, we ended up with this, you know, transformative venue that really the public market gave us. But um, pandemic, pandemic Pistoro literally was a day where we had a full reservation list. There was San Cristo Memorial Hall, million and one things. And then an announcement made every single one of our reservations go away. And we were suddenly in a takeout situation where we had built so much for years on, on uh, you know, ambiente. So uh, hitting our social media platform hard, we started teaching people how to cook. We started a pay it, pay it forward platform and you know did all of our COVID things. We ended up with remote learning. So suddenly we had our friends chiming in to peel garlic, our children doing remote learning in the dining room. It was just an insane moment for what seemed like ever. So uh, we just dealt with it. Uh, we got a little money from the city with a grant and it was for capital investment. So we went back to what we wanted, which was ambiente. We decided we were gonna last it out. We put new bar tops, built everything ourselves used reconstructed wood from the work that was going on next door, which will soon be TikTok in a really wonderful art space. And now we're just 
making sure that we have the thing that will outlast all of this insanity, which is, again, the ambient, the, the, the space in which people can come, be relaxed, escape whatever they need to escape, or celebrate and make memories. So um, we still have that whole bar menu, and we have this wonderful staff that we're now training to accommodate all the Pueblo. And uh, yeah, we're here to last all of it out. Make sure that we're here for all of you. Make sure that we're here for our collaborations that we've done. We've done with Quake of Pueblo and Wildlife Photography. And uh, yeah, we're here for all of the memory making so that everyone can be reminded to live happy. That's ultimately what food and drink and the table is for. So thank you all so much for doing this, Pichal Pichal, the library, and all of the future people that we can Thank you guys. <laughs>Uh, good evening. Thanks for having me. My name is Nick Palmiotti. I'm the Director in sales of Sales and Marketing at the Pueblo Convention Center. And uh, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what we do at the Convention Center, what we have going on, a little bit about how COVID has affected our business, and uh, plug a few events we have going on later in the year. So first a little bit about who we are. So uh, the Convention Center is managed by a company called Spectra. And, uh, you know, we manage convention centers, stadiums, arenas, and multi-purpose uh, facilities across the, the world. Um, we have three here in Colorado, two of them right here in Pueblo. Uh, that's the Pueblo Convention Center, uh, Pueblo Memorial Hall, and we also manage the Budweiser Event Center in Loveland, Colorado. And then on your screen there, you see a couple of, other, uh, a couple of our other facilities um, in Iowa, Kentucky, and uh, K. Bailey Hutchison uh, Convention Center in Texas. Uh, so we've managed the convention center here in Pueblo uh, since 1997 on behalf of uh, Urban Renewal. So what's the role of a convention center uh, and you know why would, a, why would a city have a convention center in the first place? Well, I would note that uh, Pueblo is actually pretty lucky. It's pretty cool that we have a convention center. Not every city does. Um, I think it's something that the community, the community can certainly be proud of. Um, so the first role that probably everyone is most familiar with is sort of like local community events. So we do hundreds of weddings and banquets and uh, local events each year uh, and give people an opportunity to gather in large groups and, and just have a good time. Uh, we you know, love this part uh, that we play in the community. For example, uh, you know, we do several dozen uh, nonprofit fundraisers each year, so we give um, you know, nonprofits an uh, opportunity to um, gather with their supporters and raise funds, and um, you know we see that as a pretty cool part, uh, pretty cool role that we play in the community. We also host a lot of our own events. So, um, if you've been in Pueblo for a long time, um, maybe you've been to our bridal expo. Uh, you also see a picture of one of our staff members dressed up as the Easter Bunny, and that's at Easter brunch. Um, we also do a Mother's Day brunch. Uh, so we do these events each year, and, you know, it's really part, uh, sort of become a part of the community, um, and, you know, we really enjoy uh, serving the community. But in addition to hosting uh, our community events, one of our main roles and the reason, you know, any city chooses to invest in, the, in a convention center is uh, really to attract um, out-of-town guests uh, and uh, to stimulate the, the local economy here. So the convention center, we host uh, anywhere between like 15 and 25 conventions a year. Um, we work with Visit Pueblo, who is our CDB on a lot of these. And the goal is to attract conventions. Um, so ultimately the guests uh, stay in hotels, they eat in restaurants, you know, they visit local attractions. Um, you know, and that's a huge role that we play uh, here in Pueblo. Um, so to kind of tell, you know, unpack that a little bit, um, in 2020, there was a, the gross uh, lodging sales in Pueblo was about $33 million. Um, you know, so it's a big part of the local economy. 
And you know, that figure includes not just what we're doing, of course, but um, you know, people who come for uh, you know, boating at the lake or a cycling event um, or athletic event or a convention. Um, you know, so it's a, uh, you know, it's a pretty important part of the local economy that people are coming here and, you know, bringing money and stimulating this downtown economy. So we're happy to, you know, play a role in that. Um, and, you know, it's hard to, uh, oh, and then, uh, you know, so hopefully when they get here, right, um, you know, if a group is coming to a convention, you know, our hope is that, you know, while they're here in Pueblo, uh, you know, they, they may visit a restaurant or, go to a museum, uh, you know, we talked to a lot of people about the Riverwalk here in Pueblo. You'd be surprised um, how many people don't know we have one. Um, you know, it'd be hard to give a presentation like this with, uh, without mentioning uh, COVID and how that's affected us. Um, you know, it's certainly been a challenge, challenging year, uh, but one thing we've been really committed to is um, utilizing our space in a way that helps the community even when we've been closed. Uh, so on your screen, you see a picture of one of our staff members. He was working with the Public Food Project to put together some bags of necessities that were uh, delivered to local high school kids. Um, you know, the SRBA used our um, kitchen for a period of time to uh, support their Meals on Wheels program. And then if anyone's familiar with uh, supporting Pueblo, um, uh, that was originally at the, at the convention center. Um, and it's since moved off-site to a new facility, but we were really happy to, uh, to help support that initiative um, uh, while they were here. But now that we're open, we've uh, sort of transitioned into the next phase of what we're doing. And, uh, you know, with COVID, we've really had to rethink how we do things. Um, so, you know, you see pictures of a couple meetings on, you know, how we're setting rooms now. So, you know, if you have a meeting at the convention center, each individual gets their own six-foot table and make sure, you know, everyone's spaced out and everyone's safe. Um, we, uh, on, on this slide here, I just wanted to call this out. We had a wedding um, back in October, and, you know, they really just went with it, and they owned it, and they had fun with it. Um, you know, so all their wedding attendees got a monogram face mask and uh, hand sanitizer and just really did a, a, a nice job kind of, going with the flow and, and, you know, recognizing, you know, that we just do the best we can do. So finally, just to plug a couple of events, and if you're watching this online uh, later, we do have these events yearly, so you can check us out. Um, we have the Bridal Expo in March. Uh, typically, that's in February. We pushed it back a little bit this year um, uh, just because we weren't really sure what the capacity restrictions were going to be, so you can check that out. Um, we've got, also got the Easter brunch in April, um, and we'll be announcing uh, Mother's Day brunch, uh, which will take place in May uh, very soon, too. So um, those events happen uh, uh, every year at the convention center. So again, if you're watching this online after the fact, you can certainly check us out at publicconventioncenter.com. Um, so again, thank you to the library uh, for having me here. Um, it was great to talk to everyone. If you haven't been to the convention center in a while, um, please check us out, um, and uh, we'll uh, we'll look forward to seeing you sometime soon. Um, hopefully at, at one of the events, or you know maybe you're attending a wedding or something like that. So thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Javier Quinones, and I'm a wildlife photographer here in Pueblo. I capture mainly animals and landscapes that others may not have the ability to experience. Much of my photography takes place here in Pueblo, but I also enjoy traveling the world. This presentation will take you on an odyssey. All photos are for sale and will be printed on canvas, metal, photos, or frame. All aboard. Welcome to Royal Gorge Express. Similar to the Polar Express, this train takes you places that others only dream of. Along the way, we will make many stops. You will need to use your imagination as we will travel through other means of transportation as well. First stop ahead. Welcome to Lake Pueblo State Park, also known as the Reservoir. Here, many boats sail off these magical waters. This is a special place where the waters take you on greenish turquoise color. It is said that mermaids live nearby. 
keep your eyes open because you never know who may pay you a visit. Off in the trees, there is a great horned owl who lives in these woods. He is native to Pueblo. If you spend enough time with these, this wise soul, you will learn a lot about the world around you. He will teach you patience, but also how to blend in. He will teach you independence and show you how to spread your wings and fly. Flying over the Mineral Palace Park, this is a place of wonders. Take a walk over the bridge to a magical world filled with flowers, trees, and birds of many kinds. This pond has many visitors. If you look close enough, you can see fairies flying from lily pad to lily pad. Oh, look, here's one now. One of the fairies of this world is known as a Halloween pennant dragonfly. His beautiful orange and brown striped wings are displayed with a touch of fairy dust shivering in the light. He is seen collecting a blade of grass to be used for his secret home in a world unknown, a magical world yet waiting to be discovered. Even in the cold, there is much beauty to be explored. Here on a trail at Runyon Lake, we can clearly see an autumn day blanketed with winter snow. We can also see the tracks of Santa's sleigh that clears the path and makes way for travelers to, who wish to take steps along this path and feel the warmth of the trees. Flying over the land is a red-tailed hawk, wings spread wide as the wind guides his path. A lot can be seen through the eyes of a hawk, soaring and viewing the world from above has its advantages. They say it's, a, it's lonely at the top, but so often does he come down, the best of both worlds. As the night falls, the Pueblo Riverwalk begins to glow with a passionate red. The bridge and all lights surrounding reflect off the cool waters. This is a place where love, lovers walk hand in hand and share stories, woman and man. The magic within the land can only be found in Pueblo, reflect. Sitting high in the trees on a beautiful winter morning at the Pueblo Reservoir is a young bald eagle. He has not quite grown into his plumage and is experiencing his, this land for the first time. The sun reflects off his magnificent feathers as he displays his nobility. We are ready to fly with them to the next destination. Hitting off a trail behind a rock formation is this beautiful waterfall called Paradise Cove. She is located in Guffey, Colorado. It is believed that Maleficent lived, visits at least once a year to watch over the magical creatures that live within this realm. For those who know where to look, they shall find the unknown. Another one of Pueblo's fairies is known as the red vein darter dragonfly. Related to Smog from the Hobbit, this dragonfly has a bloodline that dates back to Middle Earth. His wings are glassy like the treasures he guards within his domain, nothing but beauty and elegance in this fine creature. Continuing on, on our travels, and we find ourselves on a path walking through a magical forest. This trail leads to the Marion Mines in Colorado City. The feeling is euphoric, as the greens fill the spirit of life, energizing the mind, body, and soul. At the end of the trail, there's a waterfall that is said to have healing pro properties like the one found in Zelda. This widow skimmer dragonfly is said to be related to Sprite. I found her hovering and putting on quite an air show as she flew along another mystical waterfall. It is such a blessing to finally see her land so that I could admire the beauty within the patterns of her wings and body, graceful. And here is the waterfall that Sprite was found. This is Helen Hunt Falls in Colorado Springs. As the autumn approaches, the deep reds within the brown hues begin to surface. The dark greens within the pines and evergreens really set the mood. Very little water flows during this season, but the magic remains the same. Come fly with the seagulls over to the west coast. This ring-billed gall begins his journey over Runyon Lake. He said he had to visit his cousins, but in Oregon. I wonder what he meant. Maybe he was tired of the food in Walmart and McDonald's parking lots. Can't blame him. Here we go. We have arrived at the coast of Oregon, just outside the Sea Lion's Cave. The Pacific Ocean is expensive, 
is expansive where the tide pools, it reaches the shoreline. Such a breathtaking view as the cool, crisp air fills our lungs. Off in the far distance, you can see uh, the Cape Blanco Lighthouse. Breathe it in. A messenger has been sent. The broad-tailed hummingbird will tell you great secrets if you listen close. He knows the world, he knows the world of magic and all that can be discovered in nature, how sweet it is, the nectar coated on his beak. At the blink of an eye, you can miss it, so pay attention. Our last stop is Red is Bell Rock, Sedona, Arizona. This path will lead you to the most beautiful castle made out of solid rock. The clouds above break over, casting shadows to bring out its beauty. No one truly knows who lives inside this castle, for some things are best left as mysteries. Maybe this is your discovery. Thank you for joining me on this odyssey. As stated in the beginning, everything is for sale. Here are a few products that you can purchase from both the Storo and our Pueblo History Museum. A portion of the proceeds goes towards each business. Please feel free to contact me for any other inquiries. Please, blessings and thank you to all. Hi, my name is Jesse Onis, and I'm here with Ken Cooch, and we are from Casa of Pueblo, also known as Court of Queen's Special Advocates. Casa's important mission is to advocate for abuse and neglect abuse by providing them a voice in the courts and the community to train volunteers. We are here tonight to share work in ways you can help our youth during this very difficult time. The concept of the Casa first began with the sale of drugs in 1977. He was concerned that he was not getting all the facts as he had to a safe and permanent home. For abuse, neglect, abuse. He proposed the idea of a volunteer that would serve as a fact finder that voice for the child in court. Casa Pueblo became an independent nonprofit in 2002 with Zane Grant as its sole employee. After 18 years, Zane is still with Casa, serving as his executive director and managing eight staff. He also receives part of Casa in Colorado and Canyon City and Art Valley in La Junta. And here's a picture of Zane, our fearless leader. Uh, with our building here on Abrin, which is right across from the library. Since CASA was created, it has served more than 2,000 youth in our community. Last year, CASA coordinated a record number of 101 volunteers to serve 297 youth. That's a 3% increase over last year and a 25% increase from five years ago. CASA Public is proud to have the lowest rate of youth returning to courts at 2.5% compared to the 12% state average. Essentially what that means is we're keeping kids out of the system and in safe homes. Like many organizations, CASA has been impacted by COVID. We've seen a decrease in giving, while at the same time, an increase in cases. Unfortunately, numbers show a 20% increase in child physical abuse cases, and a 61% increase in cases involving drug-exposed infants. Our brand new well-being report also offers new insight, showing that only 39% of our youth in Colorado CASAs have appeared at school full-time year-round since March. However, it does show that Colorado CASA volunteers have remained steadfast by our kids, with 90% of our volunteers remaining in constant contact, virtually or in person, since March. Our goals as we continue to move into COVID in these next few hard months are to add 25 new volunteers to our current 101 and to serve a minimum of 250 abused, neglected youth in Pueblo County. And here are a few photos of our amazing case supervisors. We have Kendra, Christy, Heather, and Angela. We also have an amazing office manager, Sarah, who keeps us all together. Thank you, Sarah. If you are moved by our mission tonight, you can help us in one of four ways. You can volunteer. You can become a community outreach sponsor. You can give and benefit from the child care tax credit, or you can share a message. And now Tammy is going to tell you more about volunteering. The path to becoming a volunteer is easy. Informational sessions are held virtually throughout the year. For those who decide they'd like to move forward in the process, there's an application link which can be found on our website. Once completed, a face-to-face -face interview is scheduled and the background checks are started.
training to become a CASA or court appointed special advocate consists of a 40 hour training currently done in a hybrid fashion consisting of online and in person class time. Included in this training is a court observation where potential volunteers watch our current classes speak in court, interact with caseworkers, attorneys, and the judge. Our CASA volunteers take the responsibility seriously. They visit with children wherever they are placed, they visit family homes and foster homes, they attend meetings with all professionals on the case, and they attend school meetings. They get to know the child's circumstances well enough so they can make recommendations to the court about what is in the best interest of the child. They are the child's voice. All of this advocacy is done with the assistance of our caring and supportive case supervisors. Our supervisors attend all court hearings, initial home visits, help with court reports, help to problem solve, and most importantly, they give guidance when needed. Our supervisors feel passionate about the, the work our volunteers do. Our volunteers are the heart and soul of our mission. Our volunteers give of themselves and they give their time to a stranger's child. They want every child to be safe, protected, valued, and nurtured. We strive to provide them with ongoing learning opportunities, social gatherings, and an opportunity to see the difference they are making in the lives of children. What makes our volunteers the most nervous? Speaking up in court. But once they realize that they are the voice of a child, that they speak for a child who may be separated from their sibling or living in foster care, all of the causes fears fade away. It is their responsibility to have the needs of the child heard. For our older youth who are forced to age out of the system, we, we provide a life skills class called Fostering Futures. Our teens come together and enjoy a meal, prepare for life after foster care, and can earn money by attending classes and completing tasks necessary for their future. For many, this money can help with rent, school, or a down payment on their first car. You can imagine that the holidays can be hard for our class of kids. Through the generous donations from our caring community, we try and make the holidays a bit brighter. Last year, our CASA volunteers delivered hundreds of meals to our families. They delivered fluffy new pillows, blankets, and books. And in the eyes of the child, the best of all, they delivered gifts to over 300 children. The greatest joy we have as a staff is when a former CASA child reaches out to share their successes. Maybe they graduated college or they started a family. They remember how CASA made a difference in their life and they want to say thank you. Being a CASA volunteer is the most rewarding experience, and there's nothing better than seeing a child, child heal, thrive, and grow. Again, if you can't volunteer, consider becoming a community outreach sponsor and join us for our virtual April Abuse Awareness events, which will be posted on Facebook, and our popular prong event over the edge, over the edge, which is slated for Saturday, July 24th. It's an amazing opportunity to challenge your own fears while also helping us raise awareness about the fears faced by our youth every day. Special thanks to our returning and new community outreach sponsors. We know this is a very difficult time, so we appreciate each of you for returning, as well as our new, our new businesses, our foundations, and individual donors who are keeping our important work alive. When you support CASA, you are truly changing a child's story. A final thanks to our incredible CASA board and also to the Pueblo Library for allowing us to come and share a message tonight. Kids are hurting, and we need, your, we need eyes on our kids, and we need your help. On behalf of our CASA family, thank you again for your support, Pueblo, and have a good night. What a great group of individuals this evening. I hope that at home you're giving everyone a great virtual round of applause. One reason that Pachaca Cha is so popular in Pueblo is we're allowed to show in this format, in a very quick format, the diversity in our community and the great and colorful things that are going on um, every day in our community. And so with that, we've received some questions and some comments for you all. And so I'll begin to bring presenters up here to answer the questions that you submitted to us. Hi again, this is uh, Aaron with the uh, Special Collections and Museum Services. 
PCCLD. Question is, where can I see more of Muramoto's photos and films? Uh, so you can go to pueblolibrary.org slash Muramoto exhibit. Um, that's where we have the, the virtual exhibit. And uh, you can also find the, uh, the films there. Um, and we have those films in our digital library through the, um, through the special collections page. And then if you want the physical photos that were used in the exhibit, you can go to the Pueblo County Historical Society on B Street, and um, they'll, they'll be happy to, to, uh, to, to let you look at those photos, and you can arrange if you want to, to get copies of those photos, they'll be happy to work with you there. So, thanks. Nick and Ben here again with the Wake Up Bubble with the uh, Next Man Up podcast. And the question we got was, what was the hardest thing about starting your own podcast? So what do you think, Ben? Well, the hardest thing for me was consoling Nick after knowing they're not a vegetable. <laughs> um, but, you know, <laughs> in all seriousness, uh, for us, probably the hardest part for us was probably picking a name. It took us a long time to come up with a new name. That's yeah. a good one. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> what do you think of the hardest part? Well, for me personally, I don't have have a broadcasting degree like Ben does here, you know, <laughs> mass comm degree, really, really good at speaking. And for me, it was getting comfortable with a headset on and in front of a microphone. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you get doing it. So uh, I think once you relax and you're able to kind of be yourself and not worry about, you know, if I can say something stupid or if you, the more comfortable you get, the better you get at doing it. So just find out what you're passionate about doing, uh, come up with a format and then uh, just get comfortable doing it. Yeah, and my advice, if the person asked this is thinking about starting their own podcast, do it. Yeah, it's fun. absolutely. It's a lot of fun. Lot it's of actually fun. a lot of fun. This yeah. is fun. Get into it and do it. It's awesome. Thank you guys. Thanks, guys. Joette from Bistro again. What is our most popular item on the menu? Uh, it would Probably be the beef stick. It's a uh, top sirloin marinated in olive oil and garlic, and you can have it with uh, with the sautéed onion and pueblo chili, over greens, over fries, over wine crust ve veggies, or its original sandwich form. And close second, there's like our marinated pork with peel peppers and onions, and all of the things I just mentioned. And if you're talking about wine, it's probably a Campanile or a Ganache from Spain. That was the question. Thank you. Visoro, get Visoro.com. You can see our entire menu or give us a call. Hi, it's Nick again from the Convention Center. Uh, I had mentioned that we have a lot of nonprofits that hold events at the Convention Center. And uh, the question was, are there any guidelines for nonprofits to uh, work with us? And the answer is, is no. Um, you know we'll, we'd love to work with that, uh, anyone, and, and you know we'll do the best we can to be as accommodating as possible. So um, whether you're a nonprofit or a for-profit organization, um, looking to hold a, an event, please give us a call. You can find our number at PuebloConventionCenter.com, and we'd certainly love to work with you. All right, I have returned. I'm Javier with Wildlife Photography, and I'm here to answer a couple of questions. Uh, the first question says, what animal or insect is your favorite to photograph? Um, I don't know if you can all see that. Can you raise up there? So this is one of the hummingbirds that I showed. Um, I really enjoy photographing hummingbirds because they are so dynamic in flight. They can go up, down, back, forwards. Uh, their wings fly super, super fast. So when I put my camera in the burst, it's, it's such a, a joy taking a picture of them and stopping them in, in, into slow motion. Um, they're very detailed, very small. They have a lot of personality. So um, hummingbirds are probably my favorite to photograph. I also love uh, photographing um, raptors. Love doing eagles and uh, hawks and, um, and owls. Uh, as far as insects, you know, probably going to be the dragonfly, which you saw in my presentation. 
uh, just because they have so many details and very similar to hummingbirds the way they fly. Um, question number two is or says, love the format of your talk. Have you ever seen a mermaid? Um, I've never seen a mermaid, but then again, I also can't swim. Um, I do have Irish in my background and one day I hope to travel to Ireland. And I would imagine I would find myself in the beach in the waters and if perhaps a current took me, I would hope that a mermaid would come and save me. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tammy Preach. I'm the program director for Casa de Pueblo. And the question that we have is, do I need a background in social work to be a, a successful volunteer? No, you don't. Um, we do ask for just community members to come and join us. The criteria is that you need to be 21, you need to be felony free, and have access to independent transportation, and really just have a heart for children and helping the children in our community. So we love to have um, retired teachers or anyone um, who's wanting to speak up for a child and be their voice in court. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. We hope that you join us in June for Pachaka Cha Volume 32. If you or anyone that you know would be interested in being a Pachaka Cha presenter, please comment below in our Facebook or our YouTube channels um, with your name and we'll be sure to contact you and reach out to you so you can be a part of this wonderful format. Again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, be sure to share this uh, with your friends. And again, if you're interested in presenting for a Pachaka Cha program, please comment below and we'll reach out to you to be a part of this program. Have a great evening. Thank you.